Hi everyone, this is the Crime Cafe, where crime, suspense, and thriller stories rule. I'm your host, Debbie Mack, and today's author is Denise Wallace, who writes True Crime. Before we get started, I'm really psyched, by the way, about having a true crime writer on today. And before we get started, I just wanted to remind you that the Crime Cafe crowdfunding campaign is still going on. We have an extension going into September. So if you would like to support the campaign, I will have the link up on this YouTube video that I'm doing, as well as on my website, www.debbymac.com. And uh, I'm also offering a, a named character in my next book to whoever donates $40. There's one spot left for that. So if you want a character named after you in my next mystery, not the thriller that I'm coming out with soon, but the mystery <laughs> after that that's coming out next year, uh, feel free to make that donation. And with that out of the way, having said that, I'd like to introduce Denise Wallace, who, as I said, is I'm so psyched to have here because she's my first true crime book author. And uh, this is her debut book, as a matter of fact. And she is also published with my publisher, Wild, Wild Blue Press. So it's great to have you here, Denise. Thank you, Debbie. Glad to be here. Let me ask you first um, to just tell us about Daddy's Little Secret and why you decided to write it. Uh, well, this is a, a book about my father. It's about my, my journey. Um, helping the detectives with the investigation of my father's murder. Um, I, I wanted to write it because I really had a lot of trouble uh, dealing with the secrets that I, I'd found out about him. And I, I never really completely dealt with them. And I realized that one day when I went in my closet and came across a sketch of him uh, that someone had done and I couldn't look at it. And that, that, that was uh, problematic for me because my father and I were very close. And that bothered me because I'd had so many wonderful memories with him growing up. And I just thought to myself, you know, why can't I look at his picture? And it was because it turned out that I really didn't know him like I thought I did. I, I discovered that after his murder. So that's why I wrote it. The book itself is uh, very uh, gripping. I was impressed by the level of detail in the, in a lot of the scenes, and you described the autopsy, for instance, in such detail that I felt like I was actually there. How right, I, I think that's the, this. Yeah. Reading now, I think the chapter that you're in now, right? I'm a little bit. I after think so. That. I think oh, okay. I'm on one after that, yes. Okay. Where they're interviewing uh, a gay man, I believe. Oh, right, at the park, I think. Yes, yes, okay. that's it. They're trying to right. find, um, yeah. So you're asking about the autopsy? How did I, how did I uh, how did learn all, all of those, those details? details? Yes. Well, I mean, I was, I was there with the detectives for some of the investigation. I did uh, review police reports. Uh, I was there at the trial. I listened to testimony uh, from, you know, the forensic testimony. And I've also done uh, a lot of research writing the book uh, along the way. Um, you know, a lot of research on the Internet as to how uh, autopsy, uh, autopsies are performed, how, uh, you know, crime scene investigation is done. So it was a culmination of a, a lot of things. Hmm. And just so I'm clear here, this is an autopsy on your father. This is your father's murder, correct? Right. Uh, it's been about 15 years now. Uh, so, you know, I've had plenty of time to distance myself somewhat emotionally. Uh, not that I didn't drudge a lot of it back up writing the book, uh, but it didn't happen yesterday is my point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... Um... How did you find out about the details of your father's life? Was it through the investigation or was it before that? 
No, it was it was after his murder. It was initially through the investigation. Uh, I mean, I I wasn't even aware that he had led an alternative lifestyle. Uh, the detectives let me know that right away uh, with through the discovery is of his uh, large uh, homosexual pornography collection that he had. So I didn't doubt it at that point. Um, and then um, also reading through the transcripts of the trial a couple of times. Um, I mean, I was there during the trial, but reading through them, um, you know, showed me a lot of details that I had missed during the trial, because obviously I'm, I'm in emotional state at the trial. I'm not catching everything and it's been being thrown at me all at once. So reading back through the transcripts uh, uncovered a lot as well. Hmm. That must have been a very difficult, I would think, book to write. Did you it, it was. It was. Can you describe what it was like to, to have to write about this in, in such detail? Um, well, I, I note in my author commentary at the end of the book uh, some of the, the points uh, that were really hard for me. Um, obviously, the, the first one being reading through the, the transcripts about the forensics, you know, the actual crime as it occurred the struggle between my father and his killer. Um, another part that was even harder was the transcripts, the, the part where the killer recanted the crime in detail on the stand. That was very hard. Um, and then I, I mentioned that the hardest part for me, uh, which is probably surprising uh, to people, is uh, a, a point where I had gone on to Google Earth to try and see my father's old guest house where he lived for several years. Um, and I couldn't find it on Google Earth. And I spent about 25 minutes trying to find it and moving the toggle and trying to move around a hedge where I thought that his, his guest house was. And uh, that became very emotional for me because I, you know, I felt like I was right there. I was looking at the street and the alley and the buildings around it. So I felt as if I were there and if I could just get around the hedge and, and get to the guest house, that I could spend one more day with him. That's how emotional it was for me. I, I was very in the moment at that point and I couldn't find it. I think it's probably gone. So as you can imagine, I'm reliving the loss over and over again with the book. So yes, it's been hard. Uh, it was also necessary for me because I really wasn't dealing with it. Mm. That's really something. And I, I will say, I love the way you describe the investigators. They're so different yeah. in terms of their personalities. Yes, they are. They're quite excited to see their pictures in the back of the book. I've, I've mailed them copies yesterday, I believe. And so they're dying to see them. <laughs> you know, these days, the police have been getting so much bad press in different situations right. that it's nice to see them portrayed as good guys. Right, right. In, in a true crime context and uh, to see them as human beings. I, I really felt that they were fully fleshed out as human beings uh, based on some of the description. Like, as I was saying before we started, Detective Venetucci had this dessert-like breakfast and Detective Boland had this kind of green goop or whatever to drink. and Super green <laughs> shake, super yes. Green. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> you, you must have uh, done a great deal of interviewing with them each personally to get to know them. Right. I, did, I mean, we've talked a lot on the phone. And as I said, I was there with them in the investigation. We actually had uh, some meals together during the investigation, uh, which was interesting to me. I remember at the time, I remember thinking, I wonder if they're writing this off, you know, when they, because the detective, one of them would pay the bill. Uh, we, I, I'll never forget, we went to a place called the Roadhouse Grill, I believe, which had barbecue and peanut shells on the floor and somewhere else we went, I don't recall, but yeah, I, I did get to know them somewhat. 
Wow. I was going to ask, how involved did you get in the investigation itself? It seems like you were kind of riding along with them while they were doing it. It certainly right. works well, that way. It, well, in, it, it reads true to life. Um, the problem that the detectives were having in the beginning, first of all, they had no idea who the killer was. It was so random. And um, I was my father's only immediate family. I'm his only child, and he was divorced. And so they really didn't have anyone else to talk to uh, other than his you know, friends and uh, co-workers, which didn't know him nearly as well as I did. And, and we were very close, which I told them. So um, in our initial, uh, my initial interview with them, they, they asked me where he lived previously because the apartment where he'd been found murdered uh, was a, a place where he'd only lived for a month. So they asked me uh, where he'd previously lived. And I said, well, I don't remember the address, uh, but it's only a few blocks from here. I remember where it is. So it was at that point that they said, uh, you know, they asked me if I could take them there. So I took them to that guest house where he'd lived before. And after that, they, they spoke to the neighbor upstairs a bit. And then after that, they turned around, looked at me in the back seat, and said, where to? Which I wasn't expecting. Um, so I, you know, I took them to, I think, a halfway house and a recovery house and one of his former AA meeting halls um, to, to show them where he spent his time because I knew because he would take me by there. We would stop by there on the way to say lunch or somewhere on the pretext of him seeing if uh, someone wanted to go to an AA meeting with him that night, someone he was sponsoring perhaps. Hmm. Wow. Um, I was also impressed with the uh, prosecutor. He seemed very caring. You had talked about this in a, in a blog post. About your right, that's where you got that. Right, right. Yes, we just we talked a few weeks ago again. Yes, he he was a he's, he is a very compassionate man. Now that's a good attorney. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. Um, well, since you're in Southern California and working in the industry, I have to ask uh, about your 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 work as a what was it a car film. Car film. It's, it's it's a very it's a very mysterious uh, occupation. I'm, I'm not surprised you're having trouble remembering <laughs> it. I, my job is to find the picture cars needed for films and television shows. That's it. We've all seen them in the movies and TV shows, but most people don't think to themselves, you know, how do they get there? What you know are these people's cars? Are these you know do they belong to the the, the television crew or the production company, you know, how did they get there? And most people don't really think about it. They just see them there. But are these just prop cars, like for, parked on the street, say, in the scene? They're, they're all different kinds. Um, I find cars to rent to them. Our, on our lot, we have seven over 700 picture cars in L.A. Um, so we you know, uh, transportation coordinators from production companies can come and look at the cars. They can look at the pictures of the cars on our websites uh, and I'll rent them cars that we have. Uh, sometimes there's a car that they specifically need that's in a script that we don't have and I'll have to go and find it for them. We also have shells of cars which have no engines, cars that are, you know, burned. Huh. Uh, huh. It's, it's much cheaper for them to rent a burned car from us than to obtain a permit from the fire department and to go set it on fire. Huh. I have never thought about that, but yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because um, I once worked as an extra on homicide here in Maryland, and um, but all they wanted me for was to drive a car around in Baltimore. Oh, funny. I was part of a whole group of people they brought together with their cars and we drove around in a circle and it was in, in this episode where, I don't know if you've ever seen Homicide, but um, there was a killer that was uh, doing serial killings along I-95 and route, oh. route 40 doubled for I-95 
and oh, okay. they, they put a jackknife tractor trailer on Route 40 and had us drive around in a circle and be in this traffic jam going by the jackknife tra tractor trailer. And um, at one point, Andre Brower peered in into the car that I was driving with his flashlight, and I kind of just looked back at him like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I should have said something like, what are you doing? Because <laughs> that's right. probably what I would have done in the real situation. <laughs> but it's funny. I've never thought about, you know, the burned cars and all that kind of stuff. Interesting. Right. One of, uh, one of my cars, actually, I had a green station wagon uh, a few years back. And um, my boss actually bought it from me because – it matched two other green station wagons. It was a Mercury Sable, and it was actually very hard to find. And we needed a triple. We needed three of them: one for the stunt man, one for the actor, and one as a wrecked car. And what they did was they uh, uh, applied uh, some some things to my car to make it look like it had been underwater for a year, like mm -hmm. seaweed and and things. Um, and it was on the show Rizzolian Isles underwater. Uh, there was a family of five skeletons in the backseat of the car. Wow. <laughs> uh, and it, they sunk it in Lake Castaic out here in California. Uh, and it was only underwater for a week. Uh, but it but it looked like it had been underwater for a year because of the, the special effects, the things that they did to it, the, you know, the, yeah. the uh, applications. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's funny, uh, the things you don't think about that, uh, that they can make happen on right. the screen. It's, it's really fantastic stuff. Many times they'll rig a car with a bomb. Hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the stunt man have to drive them. Wow. Wild stuff. <laughs> right, um, we do all... The cars for NCIS, NCIS LA, uh, most films and TV shows that you see. Wow, you know, that's pretty cool that you get to see your cars on TV. Right. I got to see mine for a microsecond. <laughs> yeah. I actually made the cut. You know, I was thinking, oh, they'll probably cut me out. But there I was. I was like, you could recognize my car easily because I had a, an MR2 at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it was white, so it stood wow. right out. And I was like, oh, my God. So that <laughs> is a cool feeling, isn't it? Seeing, well, uh -huh. it was, you know, if you had your car in there, you know, it was probably a pretty cool feeling. Right. Um, so anyway, um, so I understand, that, like myself, you're a screenwriter. So this is like a double score for me because not only are you my first true crime author, but you're a screenwriter, my first one on this show. So um, what sort of screenwriting have you done? Um, I've written seven screenplays. I started out writing comedy uh, after my father's murder, which sounds odd, but it was really another form Actually, of therapy for me. Uh -huh. And I wasn't ready to write about the crime yet. First of all, I didn't, I didn't know how to write a screenplay yet. So I wanted my learning to be done on something else first. Um, so yeah, I started out writing, writing comedies and studying comedy. And then I, I wrote uh, thriller and, and studied thrillers and then went on to crime. That's great. You know, actually that makes a lot of sense to me because in a sense, comedy arises out of some of the tragedies of life. Right. In a, in a sense, you know. Um, so I understand. Uh, oh, do you think that your screenwriting played a part in how you wrote your book? Oh, most definitely. My, my book is much more visual because of all the exactly. studying I've done. Uh, descriptive. Um, and the uh, the dialogue's a lot uh, tighter, a lot more crisp because of all the screenwriting I've done. Who would you imagine playing the various parts in a movie if it were made? Um, you know, that's funny. I don't really go that far because I've written it uh -huh. as a TV movie. Um, so in my mind, it's actors that I don't know. But I've had, uh, for example, uh, my editor, who, uh, who did a great job editing the book for me, has suggested for the lead, for my part, uh, perhaps 
Gwyneth Paltrow or Cameron Diaz. Um, or no, I'm sorry, um, Charlize Theron. And I had uh, my, my best friend from the third grade has uh, suggested uh, that Richard Gere play my father uh, as he is older now. I thought that was funny. Hmm. Yeah, it's not unheard of for A-list actors to be doing television now since there's so right. much choice in terms of cable and video on demand, that sort of thing. Streaming. Right. So... Yeah, you could end up with a, a combination like that. That would be something uh, if that happens. Uh, well, I certainly wish you all the best with that. Is there anything else you'd like to add for our listeners about the book or anything else? Um, well, it's available. Uh, you can find it at my author site, denisewallaceauthor.com, or there's a link on at uh, wildbluepress.com. And, of course, of course, you can find it uh, on Amazon. Um, we're working on the audiobook version right now, but it's, it's out in Kindle and out in print. Very cool. And there was one more thing I was going to ask, and now it slipped my mind naturally. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think unless I can think of it, I'll leave it at that. So, uh, thank you very much for being here, Denise, and, uh, for talking to us about your true crime book, which is fascinating. I, like I said, I've gotten started and I'm already pulled into it. It, it reads like fiction. It's, that's that's how, it, how good it is. It just doesn't, it reads like any other kind of crime story. And the story seems almost fictional. It's hard to believe it's true, but it's, it's yes. true. It's, it's yes. very factual. Yeah, it's factual, but sometimes Truth is stranger than fiction, and that's the right. thing. That's, I think, part of what makes true crime and true stories so compelling. So on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. And, oh, also, you're doing a giveaway. Uh, you are uh, giving away a short story on my blog, and you, you had a, a guest post last week about that, and as... I understand that you are starting a true crime blog, correct? Right. Well, I, I've been blogging on, on my website. It's I have a built-in blog, and I was uh -huh. uh, hoping maybe some some readers might want to help me name it. Uh, I'd like right. your your crime cafe title. Um, you know, maybe something along those lines. Well, cool. You know, so I just wanted to remind people about that that there's that I do guest posts and that you're. What you're doing is asking people to come up with a name for your new true crime blog. Right. And um, that was it then. <laughs> uh, having said that, I'll just say that um, we can use donations for the Crime Cafe story Stories Project. And I would appreciate anything you can give or if you could refer our crowdfunding campaign to somebody you know who enjoys crime fiction or true crime, please do. And on that note, I'll just say thank you very much for listening, and I'll be back in two weeks.